Although the official day for celebrating Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday is tomorrow, his actual birthday was this past Thursday, January 15th. And if he were still alive, he would be 86 years old. Now, most people know at least the basics of his life and teaching, but not all are aware of the, some of the many contradictions and changes that came to shape his life. For example, uh, because Dr. King is associated with nonviolence as a, you know, a method for social change, you might think that nonviolence was in his blood. I mean, actually, he was, he was raised in a Christian family with a lot of uh, Christian ministers, including his father and his brother, and, and Jesus taught his followers to turn the other cheek, so it makes sense. But Coretta Scott King, Martin's wife, tells a rather different story. In her book, My Life with Martin Luther King Jr., she wrote, People often wonder whether the spirit of nonviolence flowed naturally to Martin from his parents and grandparents. Daddy King, his father, tells this story about one incident when he was a small boy. Now, this is Martin Luther King's dad and his story. One day, his mother gave him a pail and told him to fetch some water. He had filled the pail and started back home when a white man stopped him and said, Hey, boy, give me that water. Daddy King said, I can't. My mama told me to bring it to her. The white man insisted, Boy, I said, give me that pail. Daddy King replied, I'm not going to do it. The white man pulled him close to him, tore his clothes off, stripped him until he was naked, and beat him. And when Daddy King went home and told his mother what had happened, the first thing she said was, you must swear to me that you will not tell your papa about this, because if you tell him, he'll kill that white man. She then picked up the club and went out and beat the man herself. <laughs> and Coretta Scott King concludes, as you can see, the spirit of nonviolence was not inherited from Martin's family. <laughs> what Martin did learn from his family was something we referred to when we were reciting his words in the hymn book as the responsive reading after the lighting of the chalice. There are some things in our social system to which all of us ought to be maladjusted. Now, his father taught him that uh, you don't need to accept injustice. You need to know about it, know how to deal with it effectively, but you don't have to pretend it's okay. And he tells this story in his autobiography which um, I do I recommend if you've never had a chance to read the autobiography of Martin Luther King Jr. or if you haven't, haven't for a while, reading this humanizes him. You see the real issues he was going through, uh, some of his misgivings, uh, the mistakes he made, etc. It's a wonderful read. Anyway, in this book, uh, he tells this story. He says, I remember a trip to a downtown shoe store with father when I was still small. We had sat down in the first empty seats at the front of the store. A young white clerk came up and murmured politely, I'll be happy to wait on you if you'll just move to those seats in the rear. Dad immediately retorted, There's nothing wrong with these seats. We're quite comfortable here. Sorry, said the clerk, but you'll have to move. We'll either buy shoes sitting here, my father retorted, or we won't buy shoes at all. Whereupon he took me by the hand and walked out of the store. This was the first time I had seen Dad so furious. That experience revealed to me at a very early age that my father had not adjusted to the system, and he played a great part in shaping my conscience. I still remember walking down the street beside him as he muttered, I don't care how long I have to live with the system, I will never accept it. And he never has. I remember riding with him another day when he accidentally drove past a stop sign. A policeman pulled up to the car and said, All right, boy, pull over and let me see your license. My father replied indignantly, I'm no boy. And then pointing to me, he said, This is a boy. I'm a man. And until you call me one, I will not listen to you. The policeman was so shocked in hearing a Negro talk to him so forthrightly that he didn't quite know how to respond, he nervously wrote the ticket and left the scene as quickly as possible. So Martin learned from his father not to accept injustice. And you might be forced to put up with things that are unfair, uh, but you don't have to pretend it's okay. 
There are some things in our social system to which all of us ought to be maladjusted. So that's something he learned growing up. And what he did was he took this dissatisfaction with injustice and he wed it to Gandhi's method of nonviolent resistance, which he learned about, incidentally, at a Unitarian church. Uh, it was uh, the president of Howard University, Mordecai Johnson, was speaking one Sunday at a Unitarian fellowship uh, in the Boston area and uh, on Gandhi's methods. And so Martin Luther King heard about Gandhi and went on and bought, bought a bunch of his books right then and thought, this is, this is what we're looking for. Now, this is an important point to remember, something that sometimes people forget. What Dr. King taught was not just nonviolence. It was nonviolent resistance. See, you can be nonviolent and not accomplish anything. When blacks in Montgomery were told to sit in the back of the bus before the law was declared illegal, for years they went to the back of the bus. That was nonviolence. It was only when Rosa Parks and others resisted nonviolently that change happened. You see, nonviolence by itself does nothing. And resistance by itself can be counterproductive. It is the wedding of nonviolence and resistance that brings about the most effective change. In a nutshell, that was Martin's great gift to this country. Now, he knew that violence and looting and destruction and all that sort of thing might draw attention to an injustice, but it was more likely, he believed, to result in even worse conditions than to right a wrong. And that's why he said to the marchers from Selma, uh, from Selma to Montgomery, who were marching for the right to vote, he said, I say to you this afternoon that I would rather die on the highways of Alabama than make a butchery of my conscience. I say to you, when we march, remember that we must remain true to nonviolence. I'm asking everybody in the line, if you can't be nonviolent, don't get in here. If you can't accept blows without retaliating, don't get in the line. If you can accept it out of your commitment to nonviolence, you will somehow do something for this nation that may well save it. If you can accept it, you will leave those state troopers bloodied with their own barbarities. If you can accept it, you will do something that will transform conditions here in America. Now, Martin had no illusions about nonviolence and no illusions about resistance. He had no illusions about change being easy, change being without suffering, or change being without death, including his own. Putting nonviolence and resistance together is bound to cause undeserved suffering, at least some of the time. But that undeserved suffering can be redemptive if it leads people of conscience to say, that isn't right. No one should have to suffer because of the color of their skin or on account of their race or nationality or for their faith or religion or gender or orientation or disability. But it often takes seeing the suffering to come to that conclusion. That's why Dr. King could say, we must not return violence under any condition. I know this is difficult to follow. This, this is difficult advice to follow, especially since we have been the victims of no less than 10 bombings. But we must somehow believe that unearned suffering is redemptive. That's, that's really what he was saying with his life. And he paid for it with his life. But even his death, his death brought redemption to this country no less than Jesus's or Lincoln's or Gandhi's. As King once put it, a person who won't die for something is not fit to live. If we are not willing, willing to take on the pain, the hardship, the insults, the suffering, the inconvenience, and yes, potentially even death itself, then don't get in the line. Nothing important comes easy. There's always risk. 
And that's why Dr. King was very careful to say that when a law is unjust, it is okay to break it. In fact, it may be your moral obligation to break an unjust law. But he said that is not the same as evading the law. In his letter from a Birmingham jail, he wrote, one who breaks an unjust, unjust law must do so openly, lovingly, and with a willingness to accept the penalty. I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty in order to arouse the conscience of the community is in reality expressing the highest respect for law. Whatever you do for justice, if it's at all controversial, there will be penalties to endure and inconvenience to suffer. If you can't handle it, don't get in the line. Not only that, but he said there, there's never really a good time to make a change. And people will always tell you, it's too early. Uh, the time isn't quite right. Wait until this happens or wait until those people are convinced or wait until all these other conditions are in play. You can try to do that. But there will never be a time when a transformation of any significance occurs without conflict, consternation, or controversy. If it could have, it already would have. Frankly, he said, I have yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was well-timed. <laughs> For years now, I've heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that Justice too long delayed is justice denied. If you're waiting for the perfect time, don't get in line. And as for those who want change without tension, you know, change is just kind of nicey-nice. Everyone's kind of happy and blissful. King's words are instructive. He says, I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly opposed violent tension. But there is a type of constructive, nonviolent tension which is necessary to growth. And actually, he said, we who engage in nonviolent direct action are not creators of tension. We merely bring to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. We bring it out in the open where it can be seen and dealt with, like a boil that can never be cured so long as it's covered up but must be open with all its ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light. Injustice must be exposed with all the tension its exposure creates to the light of human conscience. If you don't like tension, don't get in line. In short, Dr. King never advocated anything as easy, as simple, or comfortable, or pain-free as nonviolence in the sense of being passive and accepting whatever comes your way. No, he said, there are some things you should be maladjusted to. You should feel unrest when you see injustice. Now, we all know that Dr. King was not a perfect model of the things he taught. He had a lot of personal flaws and failings. He undoubtedly made a number of mistakes, tactical and otherwise. Still, he stirred the conscience of a nation and a world and speaks even today to those with eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand. And so I leave you with these words about him from a UU minister named David Rankin, used to be the minister at the uh, San Francisco UU Church. I met him in 1962 in Mount Vernon, Iowa. He was not a good planner, two hours late for the appointment and unaware of the location. He was not a commanding presence, short in stature and ungainly in movement. He was not a handsome figure, slightly overweight and clothes too small for the body. He was not a congenial person, impatient in conversation and never fully present. He was not a great speaker, words lost in the nose and ill-timed gestures. He was not a creative individual, ideas borrowed from others and frequent repetition. He was not a happy character, wide mournful eyes and lips not made for smiling. 
But if God appeared anywhere in the 20th century, it was in the form of Martin Luther King Jr.